Hello, everyone. This is Philip Shields. Today's topic, for those of you in the New Covenant, I hope that's all of us, is covered in so many different ways by so many different preachers and teachers, and it's the subject of tithing. Tithing. And so the Hebrew word translated tithe means tenth, ten percent. I promise you, most of you are going to hear something presented in a way maybe you haven't heard before, maybe some things that are new to you, and it's not going to be a traditional in every aspect subject of tithing. If you hear something you can't agree with, please get back in touch with me, write me something about it, and tell me why. Just to put your mind at ease, I do tithe. I have tithed for over 50 years, faithfully, and uh, intend to keep doing so. So no matter what you hear in the beginning here, don't jump to any conclusions that I'm against tithing or contributing generously. And so please, please understand that as you go through this. Why do you need the subject? Why do we need it? Well, because there's a lot of confusion about tithing. Is there just one tithe? Are there two? Are there three? How, many, uh, how are the new covenant instructions for giving and supporting God's work different from what we're told in the old covenant? Are there any differences? We'll cover all that. Malachi 3.8 talks about those not tithing under a curse. What does that mean for us today in the New Covenant, for those of you who are scattered all around the world, who are not Israelites? We will cover all that. <clears throat> Before I get far into it, let me assure you that I have tithed faithfully again. Like I said, for over 50 years, I'm not going to stop. God has blessed us so much in the last 50 years. And he does promise to bless those who will tithe. I have no regrets on the multiple scores of thousands of dollars that we have tithed over the years. So that's for starters. I want, though, to present the most honest and frank discussion on it you probably have ever heard. I don't want to add anything. I don't want to take away anything from God's word. And I hope you will listen carefully, study it carefully. Turn to Leviticus 27 verses 30 to 33 and I'll be reading it from the Holman Bible, the Apologetics Study Bible. Here's a short summary of what God told Israel in the covenant about tithing. Leviticus 27 30, every tenth or every tithe of the land's produce, the produce of the land, grain from the soil or fruit from the trees. 10% of the land's produce belongs to Jehovah, the Lord, Jehovah. It is holy to Jehovah. If a man decides to redeem any part of this tenth, he must add one-fifth to its value. Now, so the land is what you're tithing on in the Old Covenant, or the fruit of the trees and the land. Verse 32, every, God doesn't say every first animal you have, you present to God. He says, every tenth animal from the herd or the flock, which passes under the shepherd's rod, will be holy to the Lord, to Jehovah. He is not to inspect it, whether it's good or bad. If it's, it's every tenth one, whatever it is. He is not to make a substitution. If he does make a substitution, they both are going to end up being considered God's, uh, God's property. These are the commands Jehovah gave Moses on Mount Sinai to give the Israelites. So listen carefully to what it's saying. Every tenth, not the first of ten, but the tenth of the flocks and the herds were to go to God as holy tithe. We'll see how God says he owns everything, but he makes clear that he's willing to let us Keep most of it if we give 10% of what he claims. But what does he claim? What we just read says the produce of the land, the trees, and the herds. Malachi 3.8 again tells us what is truly God's holy tithe when it's not being given is robbing God. So we'll get into that far more details. and We'll see what the rules of God are in the new covenant and how that may be different from these in the old covenant. You may be surprised. Preachers are all over the map on this. All over the map. Yeshua said in Matthew 23, 23, uh, you Pharisees, uh, hypocrites, uh, you pay tithe, a 10% of produce of the land, 
mint, anise, and cumin. These are leaves. And have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done, justice, mercy, and faith, without leaving tithing, the other, undone. So even Yeshua says, tithing is important, but it's not the biggest thing of the law. So please understand that, but you'd get the impression from those who are uh, financed lavishly by tithes with their G4 jets or G5s, whatever they are nowadays, yachts and multi-million dollar homes and r rings on every finger, <laughs> you know, uh, you'd think tithing was the biggest of all issues for some of them. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, so Yeshua says, while we're... Now, remember, when Matthew 23, 23 was stated by Yeshua, by Jesus, he and everyone he was talking to were all still under the old covenant laws. To focus more on justice, mercy, and faith, well, without ignoring tithing. The New Covenant, when did it start? Remember at the Last Supper, the Last Passover, whatever you want to call it, that last meal together, Yeshua called it the Passover. He said during the meal when he brought out the wine, the red wine, it was wine, this is the blood of my New Covenant. Luke twenty-two twenty. The word new is in the original there, covenant. 1 Corinthians 11, 25. <clears throat> so up until that point, everything that was said and done about tithing, from the time of Moses onward certainly, was based on old covenant rules, on the original covenant rules that God gave Moses from Mount Sinai. So we'll have a lot to go over and review that. So I'm Philip Shields, Philip Shields host and founder of Light on the Rock. Thank you for coming. Very much, very, very thankful you're here. And uh, you just don't hear us here at Light on the Rock ever begging for money. And I'm not going to do it today. If you want to donate money, uh, absolutely. We, we have expenses. We have, especially if we start buying ads to take this message all around the world, uh, that will get up in the high price range pretty quickly. So can we use your help? Yeah, we can. We'll talk about that more in the next sermon especially. But you'll never be barraged with pleas for help. We'd like you to register, but you're, you're never going to be emailed begging you for, for money. I promise you that. And um, some of you have contributed on your own. And those handful of people, I do let them know of needs here or there. I'm talking about three or four or five people, and that's it. That's it. So yes... We want to get out to the whole world as a witness so the end of the age can come. That was the sign that Yeshua gave Matthew 24, 14. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness, and then the end shall come. Matthew 10, 8 says, Jesus speaking, Freely you have received, so freely give. So I've never charged those that we've actually sent CDs to in the, in the years past or we send copies of sermons to certain ones who don't have a printer, don't have a computer. We've never charged for that. I've never charged for that. But when we first started, we even copied CDs, like I said, and mailed uh, copies of, of the notes. We don't do that as much now, of course. So Light on the Rock is a free service. And uh, we are trying to get the word out. Three or four of you, and that's all, have consistently sent us some help. For one person, it's $35 a month, and it goes up from there. But it's really not that much. It really is not. And for all that we are doing. We'll be back to today's lessons. In the Torah, that specifically means the first five books, but generally God's word, God's teaching anywhere, there's consider considerable said about tithing uh, from the God of Israel, the God of our God. I'll hit the high points as we go through this sermon and finish up in details in part two. I want to thank those of you who have sent me information to read, to study, to listen to, and it's, it's been helpful. I don't agree with all that I've been sent, 
but it's been helpful. So in this sermon today, I want to make sure we cover the question, is tithing required as a law in the New Covenant? That'll be part two, mostly. Is tithing today a law or a principle? I'm hearing it said both ways. Even those who preach tithing strongly mostly are calling it a principle of giving and sharing, even among Sabbath-keeping groups. <clears throat> Do we tithe on gross or net? Some of you are being taught to tithe on net. Some of you are being tithe, taught to tithe on gross, meaning before you take any deductions for taxes or anything else out. All of this, we'll be covering this in, in, in the next one. It will not be the usual sermon on tithing because you're going to hear some new things. But keep these in mind as we go through these. God doesn't need your tithes. He likes getting us involved. I'm giving a feast at the sermon. I mean, a, a sermon at the feast about how God loves to involve his children and his plans. In the Old Testament, tithes initially went to Levites who then gave a 10% of what they received to the priests. And the storehouses, the side rooms to the temple, is where they kept the grain and the, and the food, and sometimes it was lacking. Notice everything in the world is God's. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's, is Jehovah's, and all its fullness. The world and all those who dwell therein. Psalm 50, verse 10 to 12. Every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, they're all mine. You might think they're your cattle. God's saying, no, they're mine. Everything on that planet is mine. I know all the birds of the mountains. A sparrow can't die, he says, without him knowing about it. All the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you, for the world is mine in all its fullness. Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 14. At the end of it, I just want to jump to verse 14 for time's sake. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to Jehovah your God. Also the earth belongs to God. All the earth with all that's in it. So keep that in mind. So being willing to uh, realize that everything you think you own, your clothes, your house, your car, your children, your animals, your gardens, your land, really belongs to God. And Yeshua said, where your heart is, uh, where you put your, where your money shows where your heart is. Look at Matthew 6, verses 19 to 21. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. So what do we all try to do? We try to buy more gold, more silver, invest more in the stock market or not. Um, we buy investment properties. At the same time, we're going to be judged by what we do with what we've been given. So there's a balance here. Remember the ones he gave some money to, and the guy who just put it in a bag and, and buried it was punished for that. So there's a balance. There's a middle ground here. Matthew 6, 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Don't. Where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in to steal. Excuse me a second here. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. God wants us to treasure him. He wants us to treasure the kingdom of heaven. Be aware that Jewish rabbis and ministers today disagree on whether there was one tithe or two or three tithes. Even Josephus, the historian, even Josephus was very clear that he believed there were three separate tithes. There was the first tithe that went to the Levites. There was a second tithe that was shared with Levites, but was primarily to be used by those going to the festivals, called the festival tithe or second tithe. And then there was a third tithe, also called a poor tithe for the poor, and also to be shared again with the Levites, who didn't have any uh, land really given them, except a little bit around the cities they were given. It was never every third year. Uh, as I've heard over and over again, the third tithe, if you believe in the third tithe. Um, remember, I'll just toss this out now. Remember, the seventh year, Israel was commanded not to plant anything during the seventh year. So therefore, at the end of the seventh year, there was no harvest. 
but whatever grew of its own, you know, from, from previous plantings and all that, whatever came up on its own were for the poor and for the animals, for anybody else that could use it. But you had no produce, you had no yield, you weren't allowed to harvest anything the seventh year. So there was no tithing the seventh year. And so the third year, there was something special about the third year and the sixth year, the seventh year was not counted. Then you start three again and then the sixth again and then the seventh one again. So um, anyway, more on that as we go along. Many rabbis explained that it was just one tithe that was used differently, different places, different times, but that gets confusing. There was just a lot of disagreement on tithing. So let's go through it again, more detail. I'm totally against those of you who hear or those of you who listen to or give any money to these multi-million dollar mega televangelists who tell you to send in two, three, ten, twenty thousand dollars, God will prosper you for doing this. <clears throat> Don't you believe it? Don't you believe it? Okay. And um, they're beggars who demand that you support their lavish li lifestyle. That's not what we're talking about here. This sermon is not about that kind of scam, okay? And I've heard some of them demand people even uh, put in their will that their house goes to that work, that organization, that whatever they have in savings and investments goes to that uh, televangelism. What utter robbery, utter robbery. That's not light on the rock, folks, okay? That's not us. So let's start digging this matter of tithing. Let's go to be turning to Genesis 14, but the first time tithing, which means giving a tenth, is even mentioned in the Bible is Abram, later named Abraham, about 2000 BC, about 500 years before Moses. These are rough numbers. And about 500 years roughly before they came out of Egypt, before there was a, Mo a Moses, before there was a Levi, before there was an Israel, okay, or Jacob or whatever. There's no mention of tithing in the Bible before Abraham or Abram. There's no mention of it. <clears throat> Even in the account with Abram, it's not described as a tithing law. It's not. It just says he tithed, but it's not described as a law. Or, or we're not told he tithed because it was the law, or he, if he tithed because it was voluntary. We're not told is the honest answer to tell you. I wish we got that clarity from Scripture. All we know is that there was a battle. Abraham got involved in it. He tithed of the spoils of the war. Of the war. Hebrews 7, 4 says that. And yet tithing on the spoils of war was never required by God when God gave the rules on what to do with spoils of war later on to Israel. I'll give you the scriptures later on. You read all the scriptures about spoils of war. God himself never asked for a tithe on the spoils of war. This wasn't one of the things that he required, as you'll see later on. But let's read what happened with Abraham or Abram. In Genesis 14, verses 8 to 18, I'm going to summarize it first for time's sake. You can go back and reread it. I'll post it up here as I'm talking about it. You had five kings. There were five city-states, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboam, and Zoar, that all had a king, more like a mayor today, but anyway, but a king, and, 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 and the city was theirs. And uh, there, there were four powerful kings from Mesopotamia, the area today of Babylon and east of that, that had united and were conquering everywhere they went. They hadn't lost any battles. And now they came up to the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the Sodomites, Gomorrites, fled. And there were salt pits there, and asphalt pits. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions. That's verse 11, Genesis 14, verse 11. And verse 12, they also took Lot, Abram's brother's son, his nephew, who dwelt in Sodom, who dwelt in Sodom. They took Lot and uh, his goods and departed. Someone had escaped, came back to Abram, tells him about it. And Abram had had a, uh, uh, had had, had a, an alliance with a couple other men. 
uh, three other men, and um, they, they're mentioned here in verse 13. Uh, Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol, brother of Aner, and they were allies with Abram. Now when Abram heard, I mean verse 14, Genesis 14, 14. Now when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, this is his brother's son, really, his nephew, he armed his 318 trained servants. So Abram not only had servants and even slaves, but he had 318 who were trained and this implies, in context, militarily trained, and who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Now, he's in what would be known today as southern Israel. Dan is up in northern Israel, and here's a, a man in his middle 80s probably by now, um, maybe 83, 84, 82, somewhere in there. I think it was 86 when he had, uh, when he had Ishmael. This was before Ishmael. So he probably was 82, 83 years old at this point. And he pursues them all the way, and he divided his forces against them, verse 15, and attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. So this guy's in his 80s, and he's attacking and fighting and going a long ways. This is at least 100 plus miles. And so he brought back all the goods. He won the battle. In other words, God gave him the victory and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, and as well as the women and the people. The king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Shadi, Shave, after his return from defeating all these other ones and the kings who were with him. And um, frankly, the battle was a big deal. Had those four kings from Mesopotamia not been defeated, I think we would have seen a rise normally of what we know today as Babylon and uh, Assyria and all of those other powerful nations that came up later on. But anyway, he defeated them. Had they not been crushed, it could be a different story. Now, Genesis 14, 18 to 24, Melchizedek, king of Salem. Okay, so he's back now. And the area of Salem, Jerusalem, was not where Abraham lived. He lived south of that, Hebron, down those areas usually, which is south of all that. But anyway, Melchizedek, which mentioned also in Hebrews 7. In part 2, I'll go into far more detail about what happened here. He brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. We know him today as the one who became Yeshua, who became Jesus. And he, Melchizedek, blessed him, Abraham, or Abram, and said, Blessed be Abram, Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Here we have it again. God owns everything. <clears throat> blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So Melchizedek makes it clear, hey, you won that battle in a very dramatic way because Jehovah, God Most High was the one who made it all happen. And so he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. This is the first time the word tithe, tithing, tithe, tithes, is mentioned in the Bible. He gave Melchizedek a tithe of all. Some sermons I've heard have made a big deal of the word of all. So we're, that, that shows us today we're supposed to tithe of everything. But not so fast. Hebrews 7, 4. Hebrews 7, 4. We can pop it up there maybe now. Consider how great this man was, this Melchizedek, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth, a tithe, of the spoils. So what it's saying here is all, of all the spoils that belong to Abram, he tithed. It didn't all belong to him because the ones who helped him, the guys who were part of his alliance, Abraham makes it clear that, hey, they get their share. The rest I will tithe on it. And, um, and then anyway, verse 21, the king of Sodom said to Abraham, give me the persons and take everything else for yourself. He was trying, I think, to buy Abraham into an alliance with him to be his protector you can have all of that in return. You protect me. I, I, that, that's what some imply. Could be true. Abram says, "No, I. 
don't want anyone to think I become wealthy because of what you've done. Everything I have has come from God Most High, is what he's saying in verses 22 to 24. I don't want you saying in the verse 23 that you made Abram rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who went with me. Honor Eshkol and Mamre, let them take their portion. Everything else, he tithed, gave 10% of everything else. And so, spoils is the context of what he tithed on. He doesn't mention grain, it doesn't mean, or whatever was in the spoils, if that included grain and food and clothing, whatever. So do we know for sure that Abram, Abram was tithing before this encounter? We don't, we frankly don't. I suspect he did. Many think he did. Truth is, we're not told. We're simply not told. Did he continue tithing to Melchizedek after this point? Again, I believe so, but frankly, we're just not told. Genesis 14 could have been a free will decision, a voluntary decision by Abram to give 10% to God Almighty. I don't know that anyone can use Genesis 14, in other words, as proof, solid proof, that we should be tithing on everything, or that it's a law. The reason I say this, and we'll post up the scriptures right now, God's rules for spoils of war, I will not take the time to read it now, but you can, Numbers 31, has a lot of rules of what to do with spoils of war. The people you capture, the animals, and everything else. Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 to 15. Joshua 11, verses 14 to 15. And so, and so on. Never is tithing on the spoils included by God as a requirement. Never. So whatever Abraham, Abraham did, or Abraham did, when, when the laws were given by God, codified as tithing laws, it never included spoils of war. So since God doesn't change, and since I personally do not think that tithing on the spoils of war was God's stated wish or law, it makes me believe that Abram tithed voluntarily of the spoils of war. Again, God's stated laws on spoils of war to give to Moses did not include anything about tithing. Go, go look at those scriptures I gave you. Nothing is there about tithing. When we come to Isaac, there's no mention of Isaac tithing. Did he tithe? Many assume he did. I probably lean that way. But if I'm going to preach what the Bible tells us, I have to say we're not told. We're not told. And since tithing on spoils was not God's law, we're just simply not told. So let's be careful with Scripture. Now we come to Jacob, who was renamed Israel later on, Genesis 28. He has to flee his brother who wants to kill him because he had supplanted him and stolen the birthright, as it looked like to Esau at least. But here's another example used as pre-Moses tithing. Abraham, uh, uh, Abraham's grandson, Jacob, had a dream. And in this dream, it's the ladder that goes up to heaven, and God is seen at the top of it, and he's watching angels. We're posting up, as I'm saying all this, um, Genesis 28. Um well, we're not, yeah, okay, verses 10, to, verses 10 to 22, we're posting that up. You can be reading it as I say it if you're not familiar with it, or you can go back and read it. And anyway, he's seeing all these angels going up to God and them coming back down. And then he has Jehovah, God of Abraham, verse 13, your father, God of Isaac, the land of which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Your descendants will be as numerous as the dust of the earth, and you'll spread all over the world, and in your seed... All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Paul says in Galatians 3 several times that this seed is a picture of Jesus Christ. I know others say it means other things. Uh, he doesn't say seeds. Your seed. We're all blessed by a descendant of Jacob, came through Judah. The name was Jesus Christ, Yeshua the Messiah. 
all the families of the earth will be blessed by him. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, verse 15, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you, I'm not going to forsake you, until I have done what I have spoken to you. <clears throat> when Jacob awoke from his sleep, excuse me just a minute, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely Jehovah is in this place. He says YHVH here, by the way. He knew that name. People misunderstand Exodus 6. That's a different topic. Surely Jehovah is in this place and did not know it. I did not know it. He was afraid. He said, How awesome is this place? Uh, this has to be the gate of heaven, some kind of portal or whatever, as he, as he was envisioning it. He arose the next morning, verse 18. I'm in uh, Genesis, what, 28, verse 18. Double check the chapter here again. Genesis 28, verse 18. He took the stone that he'd put in his head, set it up as a pillar, poured oil on it. And we traditionally believe that he carried the stone with him. Be awful heavy. Became the, tone, uh, the stone of scone upon which the kings and queens of Britain and the descendants of David were crowned on. Now it gets interesting, verse 20, more interesting, Jacob made a vow. Here's the tithing. But he doesn't just say, okay, I'll tithe from now on. He says, if God will be with me, <clears throat> if God will be with me and keep me in the way I'm going, protect me, be my keeper, and give me bread to eat, and clothing to put on, and so that I may come back, five ifs, come back to my father's house in peace. If God does all five of those preconditions that I, Jacob, am stating, then Jehovah will be my God. Think about that. We have nothing here from God saying, Jacob, Jacob, how dare you put preconditions on me? I've just given you this incredible vision or dream of stairway to heaven and angels coming up and down and you saw or heard my voice blessing you. We don't read any of that. He says, if I get these five conditions and God will be my God and the stone which I've set as a pillar shall be God's house and of all that you give me, of everything you give me, I will surely give a tithe, a tenth, to you. But not until you do those five things. That's what Jacob is saying. That last condition, and bring me back to my father's house in peace, was well over two decades later. Then I will tithe. Some use that as a, a rule for saying that we should all tithe. Look at Jacob. And so the last one wouldn't, even, wouldn't happen, like I said, for quite some time. And keep in mind, though, that as we tithe, I, I'm surprised by this precondition list that Jacob comes up with, to be honest with you. We can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. When God sees us supporting his work here on earth, he will bless you. He will bless you. When God sees us being generous with the needy and the poor, he will bless you. So many verses in Proverbs and Psalms and so many places about being generous. When he sees us seeing him as a source of everything we have. You know, just today I was out there in the yard and I just started blessing God and praising God. Just that I exist, I started with that. And I'm alive. And I'm able to talk and see and smell and, and be standing upright and moving. And that you've called me into your, as your first fruits. Opened my mind to your truth. Given me of your Holy Spirit. Covered me with the blood of your Son. So all my sins are forgiven. I just went on and on and on. And I wasn't even talking about money or herds of cattle, which I don't have anyway, or a bunch of, I have two cars, but old cars. But anyway, my point is they're beautiful. God, thank you so much. 
Thank you for everything, even, even the aches and pains I now have. Thank you even for those and in those. I thank you. And God will take care of us when we appreciate what he's done for us and see him as the source of everything we have. Tithing of any kind of giving, really, is based on loving God and having faith in him, loving mankind, having faith that God's seeing what you're doing and will take care of you and bless you. Now, let's get up to the tithing laws given to Moses. Very important. If Israel was to tithe, once they were given the rules of tithing, it would be important that you must get this. It would be important that they be obedient in how they tithe, exactly as God said. You will have to obey tithing rules perfectly and tithe the way God says to tithe. Does that make sense? It's like you keep the Sabbath the way God says to keep the Sabbath. You can't just tithe the way you want to and call it tithing. I think many of us do. You'll understand what I mean as we go along, but understand there are some set laws God gives about tithing. So tithing in the Old Testament was to be done the Old Testament way. Tithing in the New Testament, the New Covenant, or giving in the New Covenant, should be done the way we're taught in the New Covenant. And I'll cover that a lot, especially in part two. Now, was there any stated required tithing stated by God in either covenant on anything besides what was grown from the land and the trees or giving a tenth head of cattle and flocks? If you know of any, tell me. In the Old Covenant, tell me. A host of ministers say yes, of course. Since we're not landowners today uh, growing 50,000 acres of wheat, we go to work and all that, the principle is that we tithe on what we earn, is what most ministers are saying. But if you're basing it on Old Covenant rules, that is not in the Bible. It's not. Show me if you think it is. In the Old Testament, they say it's a principle that we should tithe on every penny that we earn. But where is that in Scripture? Let's be careful not to add to God's Word or take away from it. And remember, besides, as far as the temple goes, this is important, as far as the temple goes, it was taken care of not just by tithing, but there was also a temple tribute, a half a shekel for every man 20 years old and over, every year. And there was also voluntary offerings. And there was also first fruits of your fruits and vegetables. First fruits. So besides tithes, there were, there were other things that were being given up. And now notice as we read through the scripture that the required tithing, the required tithing, I'm talking about tithing now, is on the fruit of the ground and the grain and the herds. Notice the word increase. We may have made it too much of a big deal on increase. I think you'll understand what I mean as we get through this. Deuteronomy 14, verse 22. Here's a good synopsis. You shall truly tithe all of the increase, the yield, the produce, the increase of your grain that the yield, that the field produces year by year. Tithe of the increase of your grain. Nothing here about tithe of the fish that you catch. But perhaps we've made too much of that. This is Strong's Word 8393. I urge you to look it up yourself if you know how to do that. When I look up that word increase in the Hebrew, in the original language, the way it's used in Scripture, that word is used to mean the produce, the yield, whatever your land produces. The produce, the yield. So the complete Jewish Bible, every year you must take one-tenth of everything your seed produces in the field. The Apologetics Bible, you're to set aside a tenth of all the produce grown in your fields 
Hopefully we're showing this on the screen behind. The NIV, be sure to set aside a tenth of all that your fields produce. So the word increase is just talking about produce, yielding, what it gives you. If you're making a, uh, used to making a big deal out of increase, I will talk about that more some more, uh, especially in part two. But this may come as a surprise to you. Uh, though I still agree with the concept of tithing on what is a produce, what is beyond what you had before, uh, after you take expenses out first of producing that, and that's the way in, uh, tithing on the increase has traditionally been understood. What they were to tithe on had to be something they didn't have before. The increase, the yield. Any expenses, as I see it, that went into producing that, that produce, into producing that increase, should be deducted as part of the cost of generating the yield. So costs like buying seed or paying for seed, farm equipment, farm animals, whether uh, donkeys or oxen or whatever that you had to buy, <clears throat> wages you had to pay out to farm workers to get that produce, that should all be deducted. So yes, I do believe we do not tithe on gross. One minister made a real big deal of that. If you lived in Europe, Sweden, where they easily have 60, 62% taxes and higher, depending on your income, if you're tithing on gross over there, and especially if you believe in a second and a third tithe, there's nothing left, very little left, to take care of your family. God's not like that. You're going to see that as we go along here. God's not like that. He wants you to take care of your family. If you don't take care of your own family, 1 Timothy 5, 8, then you're worse than an infidel. So much more will be coming up on this, on the increase and all that stuff. Now let's look at where God places his focus on tithes. <clears throat> Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, as Jehovah is, it's holy to him, to Jehovah. Now, verse 32, concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one, the tenth one shall be holy to Jehovah. And don't check it if it's a good animal or a bad animal. Just every tenth one is his. Verse 34, these are the commandments which Jehovah commanded Moses for the children of Israel on Mount Sinai. And the only things that God mentions in the Old Testament that he specifically says we must tithe on is every tenth of the flock and herd of sheep, goats, and oxen. Now, whether this fits and of the land and the 10% of the land and the grain and the fruits and the oil, and the, the olive oil, the wine, okay, that, that was all to be 10 percented back to God. If that doesn't fit what you have thought about tithing, I'm just telling you what the Bible says in the Old Covenant. Seed and fruits of the land and 10% of the flocks and herds, period. There's nothing mentioned here anywhere else in the Old Covenant of tithing on your salary. It seems unfair not to tithe on salary when the farmers and herdsmen had to do it. Though I did do this, though I do this myself of my own free will, it's not a requirement according to the Old Covenant, now New Covenants, wait for that, to tithe on salary or on 10% of your fishing business or the fish themselves or of your seamstress business, or your carpentry, your stonemason business. Another thing, <clears throat> I heard one minister say that there were no exceptions to tithing. Everybody had to tithe. They preach. I'd like to ask him if he, if he tithes the second tithe and the third tithe, that particular minister. I would be very surprised if he does. And I'll maybe get more into that later. I see nothing about priests or the high priests 
having to tithe. Everybody tithed, as you'll see in a minute, to the Levites, who then gave 10% of what they were given to the priests. The priests were also Levites, but specifically descendants of Aaron. Okay? I see nothing that says if someone was so poor that they had no land, that they had no grain fields, they had no olive trees, but in fact they were laborers or even indentured servants due to their poverty. I see nothing in Scripture that says they had to tithe anything. They had nothing to tithe on. Tithe on what? You get the point? It's wrong to say everybody had to tithe. That's not scriptural. The high priests and priests, certainly, there's no record of them having to tithe of what they got from the Levites, or very, very poor people. Now, if very, very poor people wanted to be, give offerings, wanted to still tithe of what little bit they had, sure, they could do that voluntarily. It was not a law. There was a base amount. Remember, every tenth of the flock and herd that went under the shepherd's rod, every tenth. So if you only had nine sheep, you did not have enough to tithe on. If you only had 19 sheep, but not 20, you only tithe one every tenth. You didn't quite get to the second tenth, the 20th. Please notice that every tenth one, it wasn't the first one out of 10. Some are teaching that, remember, God gets our first cut. I may have taught that 50 years ago. But that's not what Scripture says. Every tenth one, not the first out of ten. So because of what I've just said, of having a base amount to go with, in working with some pastors in Kenya, where many of their brethren don't even have any work, or if they have any kind of work, it's two or three or one dollar a day. And they still have to buy food. They still have to have expenses. Most of them can't afford to have their kids in school because it costs to go to school. At two or three or five or even ten dollars a day. I just wondered if they have enough as a base for the principles we see here from God, the tenth of the animal, you know. A sheep is not cheap. To have ten sheep, that's not cheap. So I told them people are only earning one, two, or three dollars a day. I don't see that they have to tithe. There's not enough to base it on. Now, having said that, I remind them, and you also, Mark 12, 41 to 44, that Yeshua, Jesus, watched a poor widow toss in her last mite, a couple pennies or whatever, last two cents. Our Lord did not stop her. So I wasn't stopping them from tithing or giving. I was just saying, don't, in my opinion feel it's a law that if you're making one or two or three dollars a day that you have to tithe on it. So in fact, we help support them. Light on the rock. Light on the rock helps feed those people, helps send them to school, helps them with their ministry costs and so on. Our Lord did not stop her, but he praised her, this poor widow. Nowhere are we required to give everything like she did as a tithe or as a temple offering, which is what she did. Jesus did one time say to a rich young ruler, one thing you lack, I want you to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And he went away sad because he owned a lot of things. Other than that, if anything, Jesus was trying to show him, you know, I gave up everything. I once had power, glory, and riches you can't imagine up in heaven. And 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So he was poor. You remember when they had to pay the temple tax? He didn't have the half a shekel to pay it. He had to have Peter go 
catch a fish. And he says, the first fish you catch will have the money in there enough to pay for you and me. There is a fish apparently in the Sea of Galilee area near Capernaum that will pick up things and put it in its mouth. And so this may be what they were talking about. It's called a Peter fish now, I think. I don't see anything in Scripture, in the Old Covenant we're talking about, about tithing on your salary, your catch of fish, your flock of hens and geese, or your, your salary. It's not in Scripture. If you see any such commands, you might be feeling shocked right now, but let me know where the Bible commands you to tithe on your fish or your salary. <laughs> Again, most of us have voluntarily chosen, voluntarily, to tithe on our salary or our increase. And that you do and will do, still do. That's my voluntary choice also. But in part two, we'll go into far more detail on that. So now let's go to Numbers 18. In the Old Covenant, you didn't just tie to local preachers. You tied to the Levites. Numbers 18, verses 21 to 24. In that first tithe, this is very important. All of that first tithe went to Levites. All of it. You were not allowed to eat of that grain and fruit or, or herds of cattle, whatever, the, the, every tenth. It went to the Levites. Numbers 18, verses 21 to 24. Behold, I've given the children of Levi all. By the way, those of you who have a last name of Levi or Levine, okay, or if you have a last name of, uh, you're probably from Levi. And if you have a last name of Kohen, Kuhn, Khan, those are variations of Kohen, which means priest. You may be a descendant of Aaron, especially if you're Jewish and you think you're Jewish. These are Levites, though, that, and they mingled in among the Jews. Behold, they've given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in exchange or return for the work they performed, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. And he says, I don't want just anybody coming to the tabernacle trying to do things, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. If they do something wrong, it's on them. It shall be a statute forever that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. And since they have no inheritance, he's saying to all the other tribes, I want you to collect your tithes and give them to the Levites. 10% of all your grain and fruit, the trees and grain of the land, and oil and all that, and the wine from the oil, I mean from the uh, vineyards, the wine from the vineyards, and then the, the meat and all that from the herds and flocks, every tenth one, all that went to the Levites. Verse 24, for the tithes of the children of Israel, Numbers 18, 24, which they offer up as a heave offering, to Jehovah, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore, I've said that among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. Now, Levi, as a tribe, was there also to support the priests. You can find, uh, I, it's in Chronicles. It's either 1 Chronicles 9 or 2 Chronicles 9, where it lists a lot of the work of the Levites. The priests were descendants of Levi also, but who were specifically descendants of Aaron. Only the descendants of Aaron, only those Levites were allowed to be priests. They weren't given a, an allotment of land like all the other tribes were. Levites gave 10% of what they received to the priests. If you keep reading in Numbers 18, verses 25 to 32, you will see that. They were to give a heave offering, a 10% back to the priests for them to live on as well, to Aaron and his sons. That's uh, Numbers 18, verses 27 to 28 especially. But only the Levites and then the priests who receive it, only they could eat of this first tithe. The children of Israel could not touch it for their own use. So that's why when you read of other tithes that they could eat at the feast sites and so on, that wasn't this first tithe here. A lot of people don't know this, but I'll put more in the notes. God gave the Levites 48 cities um, 
and the adjacent lands around it, just not that much, it's about a half a mile to a mile out, and that was it. Joshua 21 gives details on the 48 cities that were scattered around the other tribes. Leviticus 25, verses 34 to 30, 32 to 34, if you want to learn more. And Numbers 35. Numbers 35, we'll put this up. Verses 1 to 8. Yehovah spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan, across from Jericho, command the children of Israel that they are to give the Levites cities to dwell in from the inheritance of their possession. And you shall also give the Levites common land around. It wasn't a big chunk of land, but just some, some land around the cities. So they had a place to play with their kids, and they had a place to whatever herds they did have that could graze there. They shall have the cities to dwell in, and their common land shall be for their cattle, their herds, and all their animals. A lot of people don't seem to know this was there in the Bible. <laughs> Numbers 35, verses 1 to 3. And it shall extend out to about a half a mile out, and then another half a mile beyond that. That was their land. So it, it works out to being uh, not that much land, but enough to where they could send their cattle out there and so on. Now among those cities, they were also to pick six of the 48 to be cities of refuge. If you had killed someone accidentally, manslaughter, and you, you knew they're going to try, you, the, the relatives were going to come try to kill you, you could run to those six cities. And then 42 others that were not cities of refuge. The Levites were the professional class. You can read in 1 Chronicles 9, verses 17 to 34. That's what I was trying to think of the other earlier. 1 Chronicles 9, 17 to 34, where it lists, these were the singers, the professional singers at the, tabernacle and the temple. They, these were the judges of Israel. These were the teachers of the Torah. These were the teachers, generally teachers, of the children, how to read and write. Very educated. They were the, they were the professional class in Israel. And they had to be supported so they can focus on all the things that had to do with the temple and the tabernacle. So let's be very clear. God is clear that the tithes all went to the Levites, who in turn gave 10% of their tithe to the priests. The tithe was on the grain, oil, wine, herds, and flocks. The temple had side rooms to store all that produce. And remember, when even Malachi 3 says, will you rob God? He's talking again about tithes and offerings of the grain and the fruit and all of that because he says in verse, okay, let's read it. Malachi 3 verses 8 to 10. Will a man rob God, yet you have robbed me? This is God speaking. Malachi 3. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. You have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse. He's not talking about gold and silver. He's not talking about money and salaries and checks. Paychecks. He's talking about storehouse that there may be food. The produce of the land, the grain, the trees, the fruit of the trees. That there may be food in my house, that the Levites and the priests could eat of that. And try me now in this, says Jehovah of hosts, and I, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, of such a blessing you won't have room to receive it all. Food. That there may be food. If I have time, next time I want to go into... Uh, Hezekiah uh, had to get this started again. They, they weren't sending it up to the temple, especially in the real bad years when the temple became a pagan place where they had Baal and Asherah poles and everything. Uh, you know, it, it, it's just... Anyway, then later on, Nehemiah had to do the same thing, get them all restarted again. And then it happened again in the days of Malachi that they were once again letting that drift by. And if you keep reading Malachi 3 after verse 10, to show you that it was the food and the grain he was talking about, he talks about keeping the locusts, the devourers, the devourer away from destroying your crops. So we'll start with that in, in part two. If we have time, we'll get into Nehemiah. And uh, he was a governor in King Hezekiah. How they also had to have them, the Israelites submitting produce, food. So what did we read so far? Everything belongs to God. He's letting us use most of it. 
He required 10% of what the land produced in every tenth head of sheep and oxen. There's no mention in the Old Testament of tithing on fish or tithing on salary. It, 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 I wonder why people don't want to preach that. Maybe they're afraid their tithe base will d dwindle. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Abraham tithed 10% of the spoils of war, but when God gave his rules on spoils of war, it never included tithing. So I think that was a voluntary donation, a tithe that he gave. Jacob's tithe seemed to be voluntary, but they were also conditional. If you do these five things, God, protect me and give me food, give me raiment, give me clothing, let me, let me come back in peace, then I'll tithe and you'll be my God. Oh, man. And there was a base amount that you had to have before God would expect you to be tithing every tenth of the herds and the flocks. Remember, every tenth. So what's coming, we'll hear more about. It. We'll wrap up the Old Covenant, the second and third tithe. Was there a third tithe? We'll cover that in part two. How was Yeshua, how was Jesus supported? Did he ever take tithes? In the Old Covenant, it was to all go to Levites, and he was not a Levite. Did Paul ever require tithes? Tithes. Okay, up until 70 AD, there was a temple, there were Levites, there were priests. Do we read of Paul ever saying, you should be giving me your tithes? Is tithing on salary required? Or is there something different in the New Covenant? What priorities does God place on finances in the New Covenant? There's a lot yet to cover. And again, I tithe. Or I'm generous with my giving, let's put it that way. To whom should we contribute our funds today? Since there's no temple and there aren't Levites. Or are there Levites? Some look at Hebrews 7 and say, there are Levites. We'll talk about all that in part two, especially how Jesus was supported during his ministry. We'll look more into Melchizedek. We'll see if there's something there about Levites, priesthood today. We'll see how God's church and work is to be financed. Very clearly stated in the Bible. Very clearly. So you'll learn a lot coming up in part two. I hope part one was a good introduction for you. I don't want to take any more time on part one. But part two is how tithing and generosity works in the new covenant. Thank you all very much. Thanks for coming. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we come before you. We just ask you to help us understand your word more clearly. And please, Father in heaven, bless those who are being generous with the funds that you've given them. Help them understand everything they have is yours. And help them to understand that when they help the poor, when they help where you're working, that you're very pleased with that. And look down and bless them with like the words that you've said. Please, Father, help them understand some of the, what I just preached today may be new to a lot of them. Help them understand I am not going to add to your word or take away from your word. I will just say what you yourself said. Help them to understand that and grasp that and accept that and to accept what we'll teach in part two about the way generosity and the use of money is used in the new covenant. We thank you and we praise you. We ask you to look upon us with joy and lift up your eyes up, you know, to, to us with joy and bless us, Father, and keep us in your way. We thank you. We thank you especially for what you did through, for us through your son, Jesus, Yeshua, our Savior. And in his name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others. <music>